Sounds good. Great. Welcome, my friends, to another episode of Shoot First, Ask Questions Later. Today, we have the schuss to be joined by Rav Yitzchak Aretz, and we're going to be talking about riots, protests, and property damage. I told myself I wasn't going to wade into uh, all the heavy social issues, but the thing is, we're almost at episode 20, so I feel like I, I have the luxury to do something of a more controversial nature every now and then, just for the fun of it. And uh, Rav Arts actually is a very excellent person to have on this. We actually, in the same volume of the Journal of Halakha Contemporary Society, the RJJ Journal, I realized that uh, we are neighbors. We have our, I mean, for those who are looking on the video, our essays were put right next to each other. And I got to read your essay, which is really on this topic. And we're going to get a little bit of a snapshot. Rav Yitzhak Aritz is a musmach of Beis Medrash Gavoa in Lakewood and serves as the rabbi of the Monmouth Torah Links community in Marlboro, New Jersey. His writings can be found in various rabbinic and popular journals, including Chakira or Israel, Narai, Nite Nemanim, and Eish Svarim Blog, Times of Israel, Torah Links, Partners in Torah, Partner Talk, and many other places. I admire how prolific you are and how you get your turn to so many yeah. different forums. And I guess, um, you know, it's a schuss that this could be added as one of them. I'm not sure if we'll Absolutely. take it off to the bio itself, but it's a, it's a schuss for us to have you on with us today. And what we're going to be looking at is a tshuva of the Binyan Sion on this topic about the importance of respecting people's property and how dispensable is property and damaging someone else's property when it comes to preserving life or other very important values in Judaism. So as I said, this is a potentially a relatively controversial topic, but that's we can do that, right? That's what the Torah Kadosha is for, is to address all the issues that come up in life. So Rav Aritz, if you could just share with our listeners for a moment what exactly is this tshuva of Binyan Tzion we're going to look at? Um, anything we need to know about the Binyan Tzion, the Shaila at hand, and what really interested you in this topic more broadly? Thank you very much, Rabbi Kurtz. I really appreciate that. And thank you for having me on. It's a schuss to have me, on, have, have me on over here, to be on with you. That's schuss to have me. It's schuss for me to be on with you. <laughs> and um, yes, I want to say it's a good to have a shachin tov. It's good to, because I'll say, you know, it's good to have a... Taiv Shachin Kare, you know, Shachin Taiv. So we're good neighbors. I very much enjoy your work and your article. And uh, so therefore, it's good for me to be on. Also, I, I will note that I really do enjoy and like the idea that the way to address all these various topics, look through the lens of Torah. Let the Torah, let the Chuvos be what teach us what, how we think about things instead of, uh, I don't know, talk radio or something. So <laughs> anyway, I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for the opportunity to speak to you and your audience. So, you know, it might sound like controversial. I'll just give you the background, how it came to be to me that I wrote this article and that I looked into this true of the Binyan Sion of the, of the great of Yaakov Etlinger, which we will, you know, we'll discuss about him in, in a few moments. But first of all, you know, the world today, as we all know, is troubling times, crazy times. But the time before this, that I thought the world was going crazy was during Corona, right? So we all know Corona was a little bit of a wild and crazy times. The world closed down. And then right after that, I do not remember, I'll be honest, by this time it's a little blur, but I don't remember exactly. Then we had, right as Corona was either opening, we're still closed, and the, yes, Black Lives Matters protests um, started taking place. And, you know, you'd watch and you'd see, you know, clips of uh, great property damage, you know, mostly peaceful, you know, protests, so to speak, I'm not getting political here, but that's what it was called. But it really was great property damage, tremendous property damage. And while one, any Jew, should have their heart to care about every single human being, Jew and non-Jew alike, every Jew should abhor racism in all its forms, but you're looking at the property damage saying, is that okay? Is that right? It didn't seem right at all. And um, looking around, what really broke my heart the most was when you see certain like small businesses where they have their life's work you know they're begging don't come don't please please don't come we support you all sorts of ways to to beg but you saw this major property damage people's life's efforts being destroyed and it really you know like broke my heart and at the time i actually reached out to um you know there were certain people on social media that uh, i corresponded with they were like 
either observant, orthodox, or, or observant, you know, conservative, uh, halakhically observant, um, you know, people who are more uh, in academia, etc. Ex explain to me, how does this work? How do you understand this? Why does this make any sense? They gave me like certain answers. Well, we can't judge, we can't understand, with all sorts of academic, you know, jargon, why it's okay. And it really didn't sit with me at all, uh, well at all. Then, of course, because we want to be, you know, uh, make sure that uh, equal opportunity, you know, as the article is being written, another type of riot took place. The riot, I think it was January 6th, right? Was that uh, the riots to the Capitol? So that also, like, that's also crazy. You know, what is going on? And really painful, there's some visible Jews that participated, and that didn't seem too good either. And just another thing that took place at that time is that another question that came up. So again, how do we, so I was thinking about how does the Torah look? How do we look about caring about other people's property, about, about their life's work, about earning a living? How valuable are those things in the Torah's eyes? Another thing that came up at that time as well was the question, which was a question that was debated greatly and very heatedly, is how and how soon to open up to allow people to um, go back to work and earn a living. There too, what, I thought got too little of, um, of an emphasis was there were some small businesses, the guy that has a local, uh, I don't know, the local, uh, local barbershop, I don't know, whatever it was, the local store who makes his living, how are they supposed to survive? And actually, I, I personally, I remember I had a conversation with a very fine non-Jewish individual who cleans my shoe. And I was talking to him, we, you know, we cut down, we had him come once a week, instead of a few times a week. And he was telling me this guy was like, I thought it was like the American dream, was like, you know, uh, uh, you know, came from the, you know, the inner cities and he and he built himself up and he, he started cleaning buildings and he built himself up from cleaning himself, hiring out others. He came, he said, finally, he made it. He finally made it before Corona he had. He started being able to put his kids through college and he started, you know, having, you know, be able to go out to eat with his family, go on vacations. He built it up and Corona destroyed it all. So what did Chazal think about that? You read, you heard online, you heard and you read that people said, anybody who opens up um, doesn't care about human life. We don't care about human life. Or you heard about when it came to the protests. I got one of the answers I got from somebody who was discussing with me said, anybody who focuses at all on the property damage must be that they don't have Torah values. No Torah values, you focus on the, on the property damage. So wow. I didn't and don't think that's the case. I, so I wanted to think about how the Torah views property and of the allowance so how how careful do we have to be with the property of others now right and just the just the social point that comes out from that which is without downplaying the significance of covid and the serious health risk i think many times for those of us who had more white collar kind of jobs that we had the luxury of doing it remotely we didn't really fully appreciate and comprehend how disastrous it was for people who had I hate to say it this way, more blue collar working class jobs that, you know, they lamaisa have to be at work. Otherwise, they're not making money. Um, and this is their livelihood that's at stake. It's not just uh, luxuries we're talking about. Absolutely. 100 percent. It's really like I said, it was, I have like a very nice relationship with a cleaning crew in my shul. You know, he helps out before Passover, getting the, getting the hummus out, a great guy. And I, I really respected how he built himself up. And do we not care about that? Mm. Um, now, you know, it's funny because it, it, if you think about it, we don't talk so much about in our, maybe in my yeshiva circles, we don't talk so much about how valuable it was, it is, important it is to earn a living. You know, when you talk about material, when you talk about property, you might be talking about, or material things, you might hear schmoozing or, you know, against materialism, which is very important, you know, uh, excess, excess materialism is a bad thing without any doubt. Mm -hmm. And that's you might hear about it. And but again, you know, like where I come from, with the, with the shias that I went to, they would be emphasizing a lot. You know, go to kolel. You know, they wouldn't emphasize earning a living. But Chazal did do emphasize earning a living, and Chazal do emphasize the extent you have to be to be careful not to a hurt somebody else's livelihood and certainly not damage their property. And that's what led me to the Binyon Tzion's tshuva. I was researching and trying to get to see what does the Torah say? How do you see the extent that the Torah, where would I see highlight the extent where, where the Torah, the extent the Torah values not damaging the property of others? So I have, there's a number of sugos that I we could talk about, maybe some of them, some of the other ones. Um, um, I, th I think Bava Kama is, uh, you know, rife with that, right? right, right <laughs> it's replete right, with right, examples. 
But here's the extreme example from Baba Kama. So, so really, Bidensian, so I'm going to talk about the Bidensian himself. Bidensian was a great um, a German Rav, born in 1798. Bidensian, in some circles, might be most famous and might, might be most well known for being the Rebbe of Rav Shamsdorfer Hirsch and of Brazil, Hildesheimer. And he is portrayed by some as, you know, the, uh, the pre Toromad or pre modern orthodoxy. I actually don't buy it because he, <laughs> you know, he did, you know, he did, uh, he opened the day school of a certain style and he, he himself went to university, which was odd and was unusual in his time. But if you look through his stuff, the Aruch Lanair is a classic work of, uh, I mean, uh, of any, everybody's learning a sugya. The Aruch Lanair is clear, classic work on, he has it on Sanhedrin, on Christus, Nova, uh, Yavamis, and Nida. That's classic work. The Bikuri Yaakov on, on, on Sukkah is, is, is a classic work quoted by the Mishnah Bura. Constantly in Hilchis and Hilchis Sukkah, um, uh, and then he has Binyan Tzion. The Binyan Tzion is, is, is a great work of Chuvos, it's classic rabbinic Chuvos. So he was really very much of a very much of a classic Paisik and Lamdin. He was both. He was a Paisik and he was a Lamdin, a tremendous figure. And his Torah is learned all over. He has, you know, many many Chuvos. He talked about. Um, he was one of the ones who were Matir machine matzah. Uh, on the one hand, which they show they were open to more openness to the new world. On the other hand, he was quite strict about Matzitza Bepeh. Um, uh, that that's another controversy. Um, in you know some of the work that I do, I work um, in outreach. He has a very famous chuva, which was a chuva that the whole world um, actually goes with. That I take that back. I don't know if the whole world goes with, but was very very influential. I mean, the moon catcher, for example, was not happy with it at all. He took some chali Shabbos bismanenu. How do we look at Shabbos desecrated in our in our days? It does it change? Because like as he says that. We find that some of the people come to David and Shul and make Kiddush and then go um, go to Chal Shabbos. Could you look at them as not part of the Jewish people? He ends up being makel on them, and you find his Shul being quoted by Rebbechai Moser and by many. He's very, very influential post in many ways. Anyway, that's I think that's uh, that's that's a tshuva worthy of its own podcast. And I I do have some some questions on if we use the principle of Tino Shanishba that uh, people don't know any better if we use that a little bit too widely. Um, but I don't want to, I don't want to take us too far afield on that. Yeah, that, that is a, that is a, that is definitely a legitimate topic. How, how far do you take it? I don't know if he necessarily was going with the, what, what was popular today of Tino Kshanishba. He just didn't, when, when it used to, it was, or it is that, uh, that or it was that if you are, if you are Bechal Shabbos, you were like, Kofar in a Kodesh Baruch Hu as being the creator of uh, right, but if you're showing up to Shul, then clearly you acknowledge Hashem is the creator. And they're saying, <laughs> So how does that work? So he, that seems to be a little bit of a. That's what he was a little bit uh, struggling with. Um, uh, and he, but by, by that chuva, by the way, he he writes um, in front of that chuva like La Lacha Vadol Maisa. He writes, but it ends up being, believe me, it's used. <coughs> oh, we, we 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 conveniently omit that line. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. It happens a lot, actually. <laughs> okay, so but back to this. So this chuva is uh, a, um, a little bit of background of the chuva itself, and a little bit of what some other achrayim say about this sugya, and then maybe into what he has to say. So the sugya is really based on a gemara in Baba Kama, like I mean, Kurtz, like you said, in Baba Kama. But the gemara Baba Kama is a very interesting gemara on daf samacham abeis. The gemara Baba Kama talks about. The Gemara makes a dash of psukim um, uh, from, from, from Nach about, about David HaMelech um, asking Sanhedrin. And what does he end up asking them? He asks them, and actually the debate in the Gemara. The debate in the Gemara, what was David HaMelech's question that he wanted to ask the Sanhedrin? It might have been, what's, what's the halach of Tomun Ba'esh, about things that are damaged to fire when it's hidden? It might have been about if you steal or damage with the intent of paying back, is that okay? But then the Gemara has... Another question, and these are the words of the Gemara: Mahu lahatzel atzma the moment chavero. Is it permitted to save yourself with your friend by damaging your friends um, with, with your friends' money? And the Gemara, what they was talking about, the question is that they were polished mm -hmm. Maybe this is also a little relevant to our days. They were polished him that were hiding in, in, in the field. Could he burn down the field, basically, to get the police them out? And, this and, is um, um, very relevant to what we're seeing in Eretz Yisrael right now with the war that's going on at the time of recording in Gaza. Absolutely. Like over there, you know, the property damage during to Gaza, but if that's the way to, you know, uh, get out the terrorists, so to speak, is it what or not? Now, right, but here was Jewish fields that they wanted to burn down. That's right, the right. And again, and the questions are going to, you're going to see the question, you, you have to know, uh, I don't want, that's actually, I'm, I'm sure you've talked about it, I'm sure you have a lot to say about it, but it's a different topic, because the Gemara over here says, what's, what's, what's shocking about the Gemara, 
What's talking about the Gemara here is that the Gemara actually says, the Gemara says that they told him, no, you cannot save yourself by um, uh, by by, uh, by by damaging your friend's property. But then they answer him, but you can. I mean, in other words, the halacha is that that's not permit permissible, but you're allowed to because you're a melech atah. You're a melech, you're a king. And a melech porates la sloderech. A king has certain rights that regular individuals don't have. So it seems to be, if you read the Gemara on the simplest look at it, it seems to me the Gemara is telling you, you may not save your life by... Um, uh, by damaging somebody else's property. Now, that obviously is a very, very shocking idea. Why? We all know why it's a shocking idea, because we know that any mitzvah in the Torah, there's nothing in the Chadaver that, uh, that stands in front of Pikuach um, Nefesh, except for Avodah Zorah, Kilerayas, and Shri Chastamim. Why would stealing or damaging somebody else's property, why would that... Um, am I frozen here? No, no, you're you're good. <laughs> why why would I'm sorry? Why would um why would stealing or damaging somebody else's property um be forbidden if it's gonna save a life? How how is that even possible? Mm. So 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 actually many we shown him, a number we shown him, like like the rush, the rush says, the rush says, of course not. Because the, the word is of course not saying it's obvious, the rush says. I mean, I can read the language of the rush, the rush says, the rush says, Pshitahi, that you're allowed to. Of course it's permissible to do. The only question is, is if um uh, is if you do so, do you have to pay back or not? I mean, Tyson has the same thing. Tyson says the same thing. He says, if you're, if you're obligated to pay back or not. Right. So, so it sounds like Tosa's school of thought kind of um, limits the scope of the question to just do I that, you know, if I use my friend's baseball bat to hit a burglar who's about to kill me and then I break his bat in the process, do I then have to reimburse him for the bat? But obviously I could take his baseball bat to defend myself. 100%. That's exactly right. That's Tosos. That's the rush. That's many, many Rishonim. Now, the the Arachoner, I mean the the Binyan Tzion, the Arachoner, he points out he's he, he makes a deek in Rashi, which others are medayik, and so the Rashi points out at the end of the Amud, Rashi seems to say that no, that because David Bach didn't do it, the, and and and, uh, and he says he comes out and says that no, Rashi says the it is forbidden to save yourself um, uh, by using your friend's property, and that's why David Bach didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't do it because that, and you know, he he didn't rely on this. He didn't want to rely on his hatter of being the king because it's 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 forbidden. It's forbidden to do so. So now, uh, before uh, okay, so that that so now, it, it's the Aruch points out the the points out this Rashi. Now before we we even you know discuss a little bit more about what he has to say, just to give you a little bit of a, so how is that possible? How, how, I mean how is that possible? How how could that be? So no, I'll give you that. Moshe Feinstein in the Chuva he writes it's impossible. It, it, it's not possible to say. And he says that whatever we have to, he basically says something to the language, similar to the language of whatever we have to be a dochek to understand this Gemara, it's better to make a dochek to understand the Gemara than to say something that's impossible. It can't be said. It's impossible to be said. So that's that's what Moshe says. Now, there are others. I'm uh, uh, Kluger in a little bit of a different context, but it ends up being the same idea. He comes up with something, which we'll, we'll see in a minute, that uh, that the Rochaner also, the, the Bidyan Sion, also seems to say. What does he say? He says a big Kiddush. He says God, so to speak, forgives his mitzvos for um, you to damage. God's honor. It's me. I mean, God says, I told you to do something. I'm allowing you to transgress my law to damage somebody else. I'm not allowing you, but there's some human being here. There's an, uh, fine, but not so fine because, uh, because the, I, we allow you to damn, we allow you to transgress mitzvos, but not what's relevant to your friend. Okay. Right. That's so that's, so that, that's an interesting svar. I understand it conceptually that, you know, Hashem says, I'm willing, you know, almost like with Hachnas Azorchim, with Avram Avinu, uh, right. Avram could kind right. of, you know, it, put, disregard example. the Shekhinah there and welcome the angels who are visiting, even though you don't know that they were angels. But, I mean, there's many other mitzvos that could be subsumed under interpersonal mitzvos, under Ben Adam Lechavero. This almost sounds like, just from the Binyan Sion's reading of Rashi, more limited in scope to property specifically. There's something special about property I think I think maybe he mentions a svara that property it's like your livelihood, which is and you know we know that one of the three things that you're not supposed to give up your life for that you're supposed to give up your life for is not murdering somebody else. So 
We have many Midrashim, like with uh, Yaakov and Alifaz, when he lost everything, when he became poor and he lost all of his livelihood and his worldly possessions. It's Ki'ilu who mays, it's as if he was already dead. So is that one of the, uh, I remember seeing that. I don't, I don't remember if that's in the well, I don't know, yeah. but it's in this true mention. There's not, there's the, not, that, those considerations are mentioned. They're mentioned by others, I think, more than the Bidget Seed himself. He, he doesn't mention that um, um, as much as others. Others do mention those considerations. And others say exactly your point. And, you know, they, they, we say... Others point out that we say in the Shema, we say, And Chazal say, It's possible we have somebody. And again, you know, if you, if you look in, I, I know that you look in Art Scroll, interpretation of that Gemara, who, who they say, if there's somebody who's, whose money is more beloved than, um, than, than, than their body. So, so how is that possible? So if I'm not mistaken, I, I don't want to, you have to check me on this, but I think Art Scroll says, we're talking about somebody who has not um, fully um, brought inside of himself the Torah attitude that life is more important than money. <laughs> Others say that's not the case. Yeah, a little muster schmooze in there. Yeah. I was like, no, it's not the case. There's some people that poverty, like 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 you were saying, all those people said poverty is worse than death. That's definitely something that I brought down in the article. I brought down things like that from others. That's definitely an important point. So I mean, it seems, it seems to, to be a chalic between theft and others. I want to I'll mention a few points just now. Flava Kluger, he says a very interesting idea. He says, he says a very, uh, um, I mean, it's a shocking idea as well. He says that God says, so to speak, he 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 wants to explain this concept, differentiation between, um, uh, between, um, between a God and so to speak and others. He says that there's a svara to say that when you when you save a life by transgressing God's laws. God says, save your life now so that you may be able to keep many other mitzvahs. This is what Shlomo Kluger talking. So therefore, it makes sense, so to speak. It's worth it for God to say, I allow you to transgress this now because you'll keep many other mitzvahs in the future. It's a good deal for God. So therefore, God lets everything go except for the three big ones. But when it comes to your fellow human being, what gain does he get by the mm. fact that you uh, transgress the mitzvah? He doesn't gain anything. What am I gaining? So he talks about if you can pay him back, fine. If you're not going to pay him back, you know what? What, what are we getting now? Again, it's a little bit of a for the sake. Does a, the fellow Jew gain nothing by your mitzvahs? Aren't we? Police you know, are Ravens. Uh, I hear. Like so I hear. You know, conceptually that that sits with me very well. That resonates with me also. I just wonder. It sounds like without seeing it inside that he's extrapolating. From that principle, which seems limited to Hilchel Shabbos, that's better to break one Shabbos so you keep many Shabbosos in the future. That that that, to my knowledge, is only said in regards to Hilchel Shabbos. But he wants to expand that to all uh, mitzvos being adam lemakom, all mitzvos that are strictly between and us Shlomo and God. Which, that's a bit of a jump, no? I do think it's a bit of a jump. Shlomo Kugin does say it, but I want. I have a bigger problem. To be honest, with you I have, a, I have a bigger problem. The Bir Alocha, and actually Rashi himself elsewhere says that all these reasons are to desecrate even Shabbos to save another Shabbos are not the actual reason. Because the, the Baraloga points out that if somebody is um, uh, not going to ever, somebody's uh, just live five minutes more, will never be able to do anything meaningful for another Shabbos. Um, uh, or somebody, the the the... The, um, the, the Baralacha points out somebody who will never do mitzvahs, a shote, you know, somebody who is not in the category able to do mitzvahs. He says it's simple to him, the Baralacha says. He's, he, he's like, wonders how anybody can doubt this, although there might be some who do. Um, uh, how can be, it's, it's no doubt you save a life, to, even if they're not going to keep any other Shabbos, because the reason we save a life is, as the Baralacha and others bring down, is Chaviv Nefesh um, Yisrael, the, the, soul, the soul of a, of a Jew is so beloved by God, more than the mitzvah. So it's not this idea that the only reason you desecrate is to keep the future is an iffy idea on its own right. Right, and um, I think uh, some of the lumdus there is that Shabbos, maybe the chiddush is that you can break it on a hutra level if it means keeping another Shabbos. It's a kiyam in the Shabbos to save someone's life. You're not breaking Shabbos, it's a kiyam in Shabbos. So maybe if someone's not going to survive until the next Shabbos in all likelihood, you could still break it, but it's on a dechuya level where we would mitigate it more than usual, mitigate the Chil Shabbos. Right, 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 correct. Excellent. But right. now... now now the go ahead, go ahead. Oh, so so let's maybe uh just I, I know we're uh time, place, time is a flying. So let's uh maybe kind of just summarize what other considerations um are important for our listeners for us to know in this chew of the Binyan Sion and how do you see it relating to our opening scenario about your observation of uh the civil unrest in America nowadays? 
Okay, so I get, I get it's really like, like I said, you know, we're all over the place as Torah learning ends up being, you know, Indian, Indian, you know, so we went very far off flow. I'm, I'm enjoying <laughs> it for the record, by the way. <laughs> so, so I, I will say like this the the, the video he, he discusses this and he brings some proofs. He is he himself raises the obvious question. He says, if why do we need a swara not to kill somebody else by saying, why who says your blood is redder than my blood? If you can't um, uh, even steal from somebody else, of course you can't kill them. That's an obvious challenge to his own um, uh, thesis. He brings that down. He's aware of that. And he just says a, a, a somewhat shocking thing. He says that, you don't, no, you don't even need that. We don't need that. We don't need my chazis. You couldn't do it anyway, um, according to Rashi. He's explaining Rashi. Um, but he says you need my chazis if the guy would allow you to kill him. If for some reason the guy says, kill me better than you live, kill me, I allow you to do it, that's when you need my chazis, because God says, you. the guy might let you kill him, but who's, I don't know if I agree, God says, who says whose blood is redder? So that's like, again, an interesting read of the Binyan Tzian. So I do say, the Binyan Tzian, though, says, the simplest reading of the Gemara says, mahu lahatzel, are you allowed to say? So he says the language of the rush and the language of Tosos is not, um, uh, is not so simple. Now, what else is that? As far as, as far as, so to speak, the the our, our opening scenarios, just to just to really to know what caught my eye about the shul more than anything else. Again, it's it's a, it's a, he's a, I mean, it's amazing. It's a lengthy chuva. He brings down uh, other other considerations and other. He brings down proofs from uh, from Carbonos, uh, and and any any he, and he brings a proof from the whole uh, from a different Gemara about how we learn out pikuach nefesh. But be that as it may, for what hit me the most to say is. Here is a sheet of Rashi, which other Achorana point out has backing in the Me'iri and maybe some others, and the Yerushalmi. It's pointed out that you can't even to save your life. How how severe? And the, and what what, what no, again? What's what's really shocking about the Binyan Sin over here? He ends up this tshuva again in a future tshuva. I think he um uh, um he might back out on um, he might back off this. But in this tshuva, as you I think you opened up and said, he says I didn't find the post game a clear. Answer is the halacha like Rashi or is the halacha like the, the, the Rash? That means that the Binyan Sion, this great posek, is considering that a human being's property is so important, so sacred, um, uh, that even to save your life, you can't. And to think that we could have such a flippant attitude towards people's property, to think that we can, you know, riot, um, to make our point, um, and they might even say, well, um, to bring um, awareness to racism, which again is an exceedingly important to bring awareness to, by doing this, it's a it's it's a it's a real real stretch to 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 be able to uh, allow that, and a real because we see just the extent, the very fact that the Binyan Sion considers the possibility that the halacha is like Rashi, and the, and this whole sugya that he that he deals with, that he's pretty you know strong about it. Um, that Rashi is a very, very strong opinion that we've shown him, and he explains Rashi and his back in Rashi. And again, there are other Achronim who don't really go with Rashi, but they say, but you better make sure to pay back. You know, it's telling you a little bit how severe we view a human being's property. We can't be so flippant with property human beings. And I think the, the next step would be all the points that you said, all the points that you said about, you know, like, Oni Chashuv Kameis, yes, Oni Chashuv Kameis, like Elifaz, all these other Gemaras, that a person works so hard to build something up, it's part of him, it's his essence, and and the attitudes that we've seen are, no, you could say somebody, we care very much about the structural societal issues, but included in those issues is to value another person's property is, is a tremendous thing, and, and there's no way to minimize it, and I think that's what hit me about the Binyan Sion more than others is that he actually considers the possibility that halacha lamaisa. I think he backs off in the next chuva, but the, the extent that he's very adamant about it was very, very, um, right, very, very, very shark. Sir Vartz, I, I appreciate you articulating that just how far halacha potentially goes to protect people's property. That we hear all the Musser schmoozin about how we should detach ourselves from materialism. And of course, those points are well taken. But at the same time, we clearly have these halachic sources. Even if one doesn't subscribe to this interpretation based on Rashi, it's still very clearly important that we have to respect people's property rights. That's basically all Bava Kama, as well as many other Gemaras that we see. I guess the question I would ask is as follows, which is, 
I share, I'll put my cards on the table. I share a similar impression that you have uh, when I saw the riots during, I mean, some were protests, some were riots, you know, right. um, right. depending on which narrative and which news station you're looking at, right. some decide right. to emphasize some more than the others, but clearly right. both were happening. And uh, clear, likewise, also with January 6th, I was also appalled at that too. I guess the question on our end, as especially as Jews, is understanding that property and respecting people's money is very important. Is there a certain threshold that we reach where property damage may be okay? And I'll give you an example. Um, I guess I'm not going to make assumptions, uh, you know, what your opinions are on Zionism per se, but, you know, I think we're all pro Eretz Yisrael one way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I follow your WhatsApp statuses. I, I definitely <laughs> see the material there. And if we look at kind of early Israeli history and you look when during the British mandate and you see kind of like these underground Israeli militant organizations, um, they didn't seem to pay so much heat all the time to property damage and blowing up a hotel and other kind of instances mm -hmm. like that. So I guess the question is, if we're going to, you know, kind of clutch, I don't want to say clutch our pearls because it's, I think it's actually valid for us to do this. If we're going to be upset when we see other communities um, being flippant about other people's property in the pursuit of what they consider to be a more higher and important goal, what about for us as Jews? Like, are we also going to hold ourselves to the same standard? And if not, what is that threshold for when maybe property damage could be excused and would we apply that consistently across the board? So you're asking great questions, as always, as usual. I would just say that, thank God, I don't have to always make these decisions. You know, uh, <laughs> they, 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 I don't make the decisions. I have a simple rabbi of a simple town, a small town. And uh, <laughs> uh, thank God, Claudia Strauss' questions are not on my shoulders. Um, you know, like we discussed certain things. I know you had a very interesting podcast about Pidion Shruyan, right? You did have one, right? Correct? Yeah, um, for uh, Johnny Solomon. That's right. Right, right, right. right. So actually, uh, I mean, some things about it, I I uh, know it's a great podcast, and he he was great. But some some of the positions he was taking sat well with me. Some didn't sit well with me at, at all. But the point is, I'm happy I don't have to make that decision because you know, like like he was saying, you look at the Mishnah, it seems like it says don't do it, you know. But then they're human beings. As yes, watch my status. How much I can't sleep at night because of what's going on. Um, uh, there are the families that are you want to do anything you can to take them out. So, so. The same thing would be your, your question about, let's say, the early Zionists, what was allowed. But I don't necessarily, So, but the short answer would be, yes, we do have to hold ourselves to the same standard as well. In my article, I mentioned at the end of the article, I said that we also have learned from the, the fact that some Jews defend, see, I don't, what bothers me more than anything is the January 6th people, or their, their, they defend, they'll, they'll defend that and I hate Black Lives Matter. The Black Lives Matter people will feel that the January 6th is the worst thing in the world. They're both bad. You, a Jew has a that's a dignified way that follows the Torah. The Torah, to the extreme, tells you, and again, like you said, it's all about the I just want to highlight this tshuva to the extent that it is, and I've been seeing almost considers it lamaisa. that I hold, we have to hold ourselves accountable across the board. And therefore, I will tell you, I'm, I mean, I don't get into trouble with this, but some of the... Haredi, again, Haredi are the best. We love them. But some of the Haredi protests, if they fall into this trap of, of dumpster burning or burning stuff that are destroying or damaging other people's livelihoods or even stopping them from going about their daily lives, I do believe that they have to be held accountable. Are you following the Torah or are you just doing what feels, you know, you? I got to do it. I have a value. I have to do it. I'm uh, I don't know. I, I I would hold them accountable. And to be honest with you, when I when I saw some of those protests in Israel, again, of people who are our beloved brothers, not the ones now. I'm talking about yeah, by the way, also the judicial protests, but before ah. the judicial protests, the, the the some of the well, they're coming the back, by the way. Uh what? they're coming back. At yeah. the time of this recording, uh, I believe it was yesterday that the Supreme Court in Israel right. uh, shot down the legislation to repeal their own power. So a bit of a catch-22, but that's a broader yeah. discussion. My point is, though, I think we should hold ourselves accountable. I actually end my article, and I don't know how much time we have it with this, but but uh, uh, I end my article by by talking about Chazal, not Chazal, the Torah itself, but I discuss of the Mekalel, the, the person who cursed, you know, 
the Rabbanu Shlolam. And it talks about over there, if you look at that parish, the Torah talks about the, the, the punishment that has to happen to him. And immediately, immediately in middle, before the Torah carries out, talks about carrying out the punishment, it discusses that uh, property damage, and talks about, and then it says, and I heard a beautiful thought from the name of Moshe Feinstein and others, I quote in the article, that why is all of a sudden, in the middle of this, the story, middle of the discussion of the Makalel, does the Torah all of a sudden drum it out telling you about this property damage is bad, don't hit somebody, killing somebody is bad. Why? What's the kind of... Yeah? Uh, I'll keep going, we just got one minute. Okay, okay. Very, very quickly, the, the answer to that is that that exactly at the time when you're trying to do something that's important, let's say, let's say taking out vengeance against somebody who cursed God, we have to be extra careful. Make sure you limit justice in a just way only to the person himself, not to his property, not to his family, etc. So whether it, yes, you can't cross the board and realize the Torah demands of us. There's more to talk about value of livelihood. There's much more to talk about. We should be very, very careful about our law, about caring about the livelihood and the property of others. Absolutely. And uh, Ravar, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Again, I uh, admire all the good work you're doing and all the different forums and publications you've gotten your tour into. It's a bigger success for me to uh, be associated um, in the table of contents with you in the RGJ Journal. I would encourage our listeners if they could get hold of you know what? I can't even translate. They put it in Roman numerals. I always have to put it into the computer to figure out which issue it is. But if you search up Robert's article in the RGJ Journal, you'll find more details than what we covered over here. Thank you so much for your time. And again, I, I know um, you're going to Levaya today for Rav Matisio Salman Tzatzal, uh, who I'm was the Mashiach of Lakewood. I want to wish you and the entire Lakewood and all of Klai Israel uh, much nechama on that. Well, man, thank you very much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be at the talk tower with you. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. All thank right. you. Take care. Shkayach.